Right, hi everybody and welcome to another Real Wonder Camera podcast. Now, I'm lucky to be with James Cranfield, one of the UK's top taxidermy collectors and dealers. Um, he also has a museum and he sort of let us have a look at some of his best specimens, concentrating on natural history because James has just got a humongous amount of different things he's got curios everything basically but we thought we'd just for this episode we'd do the natural history stuff James and then maybe another time we'd love to have you back and see all your sort of curios and stuff and that would be great so yeah, James absolutely I mean that that sounds brilliant so James first of well, all thank you so much for you... having me on and what an introduction yeah brilliant uh, Cheers. Yeah. <laughs> it's always <laughs> I, you know, I've collected this stuff my entire life, and so there's still people that I look up to, but I realise that I'm getting older now, and daily I get new things, so my collection builds. Um, so I'm not that little sort of teenager or boy anymore with only a handful of things. I've got quite impressive things. Um, very lucky to have found some real treasures over the years, and... Um, mm. Yeah, it's weird when people go, oh, you know, one of the best collections and whatnot. And I, I it's, yeah, I suppose I have. <laughs> I'm trying to be as yeah, it, humble as possible. Yeah, well, it does. It humbles you as well, because obviously you've got pieces in your collection that, you know, warrant them. Well, you've got your own museum, basically, haven't you? And if people want to come and see you and your collection, where do they, where are you based? Well, I've had my shop in Leon C in Essex uh, for over a decade now, Cranfield's Curiosity Cabinet. And it was always sort of my childhood dream to have a curiosity shop. You, you know, I've got things in stock from pence, really, you know, little shells and key rings and whatnot for a few pounds, all the way up to, you know, a full mount zebra and tiger rugs and yeah everything in between and so i just wanted there to be something i wanted to create the shop that i wish existed when i was a kid and so that is what i've done and uh i'm a collector at heart so um you know i keep the best stuff i i sell all the lower not lower end stuff but the starter pieces for starter collections i sell loads of that to fund the maintenance and additions to my private collection you know that's what that's what makes me get up in the morning to sell stuff so i can buy more stuff <laughs> keep it for myself and, and i'm sure it's much the same with I, you you know you yeah, all all dealers yeah. all good dealers have a have a collection have an interest you know are chasing that next amazing thing and it's not always about the money it's about finding that really unique item hmm. Is that is is everything for sale though, James? If the if the money was right, would you know say if someone offered you a ridiculous amount of money for something, would you sell it? You know your favourite item that um, you've got. Like really, honestly, this is this is what is always proposed to me. Uh, you know, surely everything's got its price, and I really am the anomaly where. There are some things, and I'm looking at one that you've asked me to uh, talk about today. Uh, you, you could yeah. put any amount of money on the table, and I really would not sell it. I, I mean, call me mad, but mm. yeah, I wouldn't. And we may as well introduce <laughs> him because um, you've requested to see him. Yes, uh, it is Grant. Well, best here. season. Oh, yes. So this is right, Grant, and he is my. Yeah child basically <laughs> he is my pride and joy it is a juvenile um lowland gorilla antique mount from the 1930s uh, he's normally encased in a massive dome but i've taken him out of the dome so you can see him and he is to my knowledge the only one in private hands in the uk and obviously i've got friends all around the world I know of only one or two others, uh, maybe three, uh, predominantly in Europe. But this is, to my knowledge, the only one in private hands in the UK. And, yeah, he's just an unbelievable rarity. Um, loads of big game hunters during the heyday, 1880 to 1940. If they did go and shoot a gorilla, they would then document in their writings, in their diaries, in their books, that it was too close to shooting a human. 
Um, so that is why specimens, other than ones in museums, uh, rarely come up. Um, so, yeah. And he's called Grant. I know of this specimen back when it was located in, is it Denmark? Yeah, Denmark. Turned up in an antique shop in Denmark. A friend of mine had been dealing with that dealer, offered it to me, and I didn't have the money at the time. He then turned up in the UK, went through a couple of people's hands until during COVID, um, the dealer that had it randomly messaged me. During COVID, I was doing um, insect identifications to pass the time. People would send me insects that they found in their garden or their home or whatever, and I'd identify it for them. And uh, the dealer that had this sent me a picture of an earwig on some lettuce that he had bought from the supermarket and was like, what's this? I was like, it's an earwig. Surely you know it's an earwig. And then in the next message, he was like, so the gorilla, do you want to buy the gorilla? And I was like, well, yeah. And it was the cheapest it had ever been. Um, and at that time, I had I, because I had a shop, I'd been getting the government grants to keep me afloat. And so... Um, I used some of that money to buy Grant, and hence his name is Grant. Brilliant. I like alliteration, a... Grant the Gorilla, but he's all, he was also bought with a with a government grant. So there we go. Well, what a good way to spend that grant as well, to be honest with you. And what a time. I didn't realise. <laughs> well, that... Yes. And... <laughs> I didn't realise that you purchased that so so sort of near. Do you know I, mean? I thought you had that a lot longer than that. So you've had it sort of five years, basically? No, but this years? is the thing. I'd known about him for, I don't know, maybe eight or ten years. Mm. I'd seen him a couple of times. And it was always, you know, a, a, a lot of money. Um, and I was just a lowly uh, dealer of crows and ducklings and key rings and things. And so really Grant was one of my first real major purchases because I had always, always wanted him. And I was like, well, when am I, when I, am I ever going to get the opportunity to get him? And so, yeah, COVID 2020, um, I've only had him four years or so. So, um, but yeah, James. Um, do, so James, th is that a thing that happens a lot? Is it um, sometimes you get offered specimens and they're just a ridiculous amount of money, and you would obviously love to buy them, but it's just sort of like the money gets in the way. Oh, uh, yeah, absolutely. Let me just put Grant mm. down. We can see him again in a minute. Um, yeah, all the, all the time, and when I'm, it's sort of bless. It's a blessing and a curse these days mm. to have have um the collection that i do uh because it now takes something really special to really get my juices flowing and as yeah. i say um i'm not a wealthy man <laughs> so yeah. unfortunately i've got uh champagne taste and beer budget uh as they say and so um yeah i missed out on some things at auction recently but I discussed mm. with my um, partner, Francesca, and, you know, again, real rare things that we said, well, we could maybe make it work. Um, but, yeah, they just they just go too much. When you're getting into the five ten thousand pound mark, that's that's a lot of money to me. You know, that's a lot yeah. of selling. That's a lot of um, whatnot. But... The yeah. heart wants what the heart wants. So we try, we try our best. Um, and last year I, I was offered um, uh, some, um, you know, wish list items and so managed to do a deal on those. And because the person knew that I had wanted mm. one for so long, uh, we, we, we struck a deal. And so I was really pleased with that. And um, it's going to be really difficult to show you, but I know you're going to appreciate it. Yes, yeah, so you're only going to be able to see a part of it because, right. I mean, you know what this is, obviously. Oh, wow. Is that a narwhal tusk? I it's, can't see. Yeah, you're a little it's, bit blurry. Uh, it's a bit of a monster. Yeah. Wow, that is huge, isn't it, as well? Wow, yeah, that's incredible. A, uh, 228 centimetres. So what's that? Seven and a half foot. 
Wow. So tell everybody, if people don't know, that, you know, this is the unicorn of the sea, isn't it, James, basically? Yeah, of course. Well, it's the unicorn. That's, yeah. that's why I know, I know you like your mythical creatures and cryptozoology. So, yeah. yeah, genuine unicorn horn. Not many people have got one of those. But it is, of course, <laughs> a narwhal tusk. And, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, all of the curiosity cabinets and Wunderkammer dating back to the 15th, 16th century would have one of these. And so, therefore, it had always been a dream piece. But I'm sure you know they can be... 10, 15, 20, 25,000 pounds. Um, and so, yeah, I was, uh, yeah, was offered this at a fair, fair price. And so um, we, I did payments over a period of time, very kindly with the dealer. And it, it's come at the perfect time, really, because um, the narwhals and various other toothed creatures are going to go on the banned list, much like mm. the elephant ivory. Uh, in the next few years, you won't be able to trade in sperm whale teeth, narwhal tusks, walrus tusks, hippo tusks. Um, and there's another one. I can't remember off the top of my head. But they are all going to go on the banned list. So it was sort of one of the last opportunities to buy one legally. I've got an Article 10 license in my name for this. So it's all perfectly kosher to have. Um, yeah. And so this was, a, again, a wish list piece that, well, that I, is a, I, I managed a, to get before. A wonderful surprise, because I didn't know that you were going to show that, James, and that in a wonderful... Well, no, I haven't, even, I haven't even shared the... <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> It, and in a Wonder Camera podcast, it is basically the Holy Grail piece, you know, <laughs> isn't it? Because, you know, you're going back to, like yeah. you said, the early Wonder Camera, this would be a significant piece. Yeah. And they honestly did believe that it was a unicorn horn when it came back. Oh, you know, a lot of the time, you know. So, yeah, it's just amazing. Well, and, and it's a massive one as well, isn't it? To be honest with you, the one you've yeah, got. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I can't quite believe I, uh, you know, I'd always dreamt, I'd always dreamt of owning one. I didn't ever think that I'd managed to get one of the, the biggest Sorry. that has come onto the market in well, the you, UK. I mean, um, you, again, go big or go home. Yeah, well, you tend to do that. You know, you've got your, the biggest clam as well, haven't you? Giant clam, you know, so you tend to... Yes, yeah. I, I mean, I I didn't realise, just out of curiosity, before we move on to the clam, have you not had an Arwhal on the podcast yet? No, no, I haven't, no. Oh, and there we go. I know. I knew yeah, I wanted it's... to show you it, even though it's going to be difficult. And this one, let me just see if I can. <laughs> this one is really interesting because it's. I mean, look, look at the thickness. I've got my hand around there, uh, it's but it's incredible. obviously a very old individual. Uh, just don't knock the giraffe. Um, the end of it is occluded, so ordinarily you can see that change in uh, color. So this yeah. part from here would be inside the skull, and. Um, the end piece is normally like a root, would be hollow, more or less up to there to have the pulp inside the tooth. But because it's such an old individual, dentine has been laid down and this is, a, you know, coming close to being fully occluded, meaning like full of dentin. And then if we just go the other way, this is going to be tricky. Let me, let me see if we can get there. And again, so I've, I've done some research on these. It looks like it's damaged, but this oblique wear pattern, that's what it's called, um, is similar to specimens in, uh, in, is the same as some specimens in the Natural History Museum. And that is just basically wear, where it's worn on right, ice. Okay. We still don't fully know what the narwhal uses its tusks for. Um, it's thought that it can um, detect uh, different things in the sea. Uh, might be used for battling, might be used, you know, if you've got a really big one, you're going to be more desirable to uh, the fairer sex. Um, yeah. But yeah, we don't we don't fully know. And so that's what makes them even more interesting. The Latin name Monodon Monoceros, obviously meaning one tooth, one horn. Um, yeah, and they're fascinating. I mean, I, I haven't actually handled it this this much uh, since I bought it, so it's, it's nice to show it that off. Is, um, um, and another thing with them, James, yeah. isn't it? They some of in the Natural History Museum, there's one with two horns, isn't there? Is, is there a skull of a well, yes, with that two? Is, yeah, a du double tusker. Sometimes um, they yes. so 
although it, it although it's we call it a horn or a tusk it's actually just yeah, a tooth right. it's an enlarged um oh is it a canine or incisor oh it's terrible that i don't know that but anyway it's an enlar it's an enlarged tooth and there is a uh, vestigial tooth re that remains in the skull because it's their paired teeth and in some instances mm. that will develop to be a full tusk and so you yeah they're rare but you do get a double tusk narwhal yeah well, i wonder if yeah, i can track one of those down like before the law with... changes <laughs> 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 the skull as well you know with the same size as that one. yeah well I that mean, would that be is... the dream <laughs> there's some of them, because they're caught by the inuit they mostly turn up in canada and north america and that sort of thing um mm. and, and that you know, they can't be exported to the uk now so literally no. any any narwhal tusk that is in the uk that's all there's ever going to be they're not allowing the import of them anymore so mm. you know it just makes it a, 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 an even rarer thing um and yeah i this, I'm, it's probably one of those things that again if somebody put a ridiculous amount of money on the table i probably wouldn't sell it because mm. i'm an idiot <laughs> i'm a yeah. i'm a collector um and yeah, so, find yeah. another one as well. Like Let you say, just... you're not going to be able to. You're not going to be able to do that, are you? You know, find another one. It's well, just no, going to be not, so hard. Not, I not, mean, they're... certainly not in the UK and and, and in the coming years. No. Um, no, but yeah, exactly. And, uh, yeah, yeah. Yes, when, I mean, some of these know, when as you well. Me... Oh, sorry. So sorry. Go for it, James. Oh no, I was just going to say. You know, you said in, in this in this podcast today, we're just, just going to focus on my natural history. Um, that is my predominant uh, interest is obviously taxidermy, historic taxidermy. I'm particularly interested in the work of Hutchins of Aberystwyth and Walter Potter. Uh, Potter stuff doesn't turn up uh, because it's all being bought by the Americans and there's a finite supply of it. Uh, Hutchins of Aberystwyth does turn up. And so that is where you know, I'm allocating my money. If a really good case of that comes up, I try and acquire that. But then the natural history curiosities, you know, the the narwhal, I've got great white shark jaws, a white rhinoceros skull. Oh, the giant clam. Let's get back to the giant clam. So again, that had been a wish list um, piece uh, it, to, to have a complete clam. So you often get uh, you often get one valve. I mean, the clam is a bivalve, meaning two halves so you get one half which is often sold as a uh, garden decoration or was used as a basin for children or a font in a church but it's very rare to get a true pair mm. and so as a natural history enthusiast and indeed zoologist i didn't just want one half i wanted a complete one mm. and so this my my giant clam came up at auction um I remember. I remember at the time, I'd um, uh, I was walking around an antique fair with my parents. My parents are like, "You need to focus more on your on your business. You know, just buy stock." And so, in this same auction, there was stock. Right, um, uh, somebody had passed away, and their whole collection of seashells was up, and they were going really cheap, boxes and boxes of shells. I just bought loads. You know, so if you ever need a seashell, I've got loads. Um, and then the giant clam came up. And uh, I was bidding, bidding, kept bidding. And my mum was like, oh, my, what on earth? Oh, gee. Yeah. Then my dad looked over my sh shoulder. You're an idiot. Blah, blah, blah. And so anyway, I won this thing. Then we went to the auction house to collect all the stuff. And I didn't realise that just some of the some of the boxes of shells were just like a lead image. They came with five or six other boxes of stuff. So there was a whole row of stuff that I had bought. My dad hit the roof and then I went, well, you haven't seen the worst one yet and took him into the foyer of this auction house and there was this giant clam and he just he just walked out. Anyway, <laughs> so we we loaded up all the we loaded up all the shells, paid, loaded up all the shells. And I decided I'd come back for the giant clam. And on the drive home, they were like, you need to try and get out of buying that clam. That's ridiculous. You know, you can't even move it. And I was like, no, no, I've always wanted one. I'll work it out. Mm -hmm. And anyway, it's only in subsequent research 
but I've concluded that it is the largest in private hands in Europe. And that has been confirmed by other seashell uh, collectors um, and from all the research that I can gather. Every now and again, people send me, well, quite a lot of people send me pictures of them flipping the bird at a shell in uh, museums because they know that I've got this clam. And sometimes people go, oh, well, oh, my parents have got one in their garden. It's about the same size. I was like, okay, well, send me a picture whenever you can. Yeah. And they ultimately do. And it's ultimately 10 centimetres smaller than mine. And I'm like, cool, it's a nice thing, but I've still got the biggest one. <laughs> so yeah. I love it. But it's 30. It's, I'm, look, I'm looking at it now and I'm all rigged up, so I can't quite show you. But um, yeah, it's 32 stone, both sides, and 101 centimetres uh, at the widest point. And it's the wow. original two sides of uh, two sides of one animal. So, yeah, that's one of my yeah. favourite things. Well where do they come from, the giant clams, then, James? Whereabouts are they in the world? Uh, Indo-Pacific. Uh, Indo so a friend of mine has recently been in uh, Indonesia snorkeling, and you can find them around there in the Philippines. There are different subspecies, but Tridacna gigas, which is the giant clam, is, yeah, Indo-Pacific. So, wow. Yeah. And there's, yeah. a, a, again, amazing. like for Wunderkammer, Sorry for for the wonder camera. You know they they're so some of them are so big. There are tales of them uh, eating or or uh, you know trapping swimmers and scuba divers. You know their legs get eaten by a giant clam. Um, uh, so yeah, they're a fascinating creature. But when they're you only ever see the shell, obviously in the antiques trade. But when it's alive and the animal that resides within its mantle is covering everything. It's the most amazing iridescent colours and, you know, stripes and spots and whatnot. Um, yeah, fascinating. So, you know, I'm a huge animal lover and would love to see most of the things that I've got in, in the wild. So yeah. one of my dreams is to go and see the gorillas. And again, I'd like to see the giant clam. Um, I have been fortunate to be on go on quite amazing trips um, with the Natural History Museum. I've been to Madagascar, um, where I assisted friends of mine who one one is a world expert on cockroaches, and his wife is a world expert on spiders. And so we were collecting cockroaches and spiders. Oh, and and, and other off. Um, orthoptroid insects so bush crickets praying mantis and things in madagascar and in madagascar we discovered um some new species of cockroach i personally found the only female known specimen of a particular cockroach lou rothia goodmanai um and then on another wow. trip i went to uh, vietnam and southeast asia with the with the same friends the specific um, uh, Natural History Museum expedition was based in Vietnam and there was a whole team of people, there was a lady collecting lichens, there was a woman, another lady collecting mosses, a man collecting small mammals uh, world expert on land snails and we rediscovered rediscovered a, a snail this sort of size that hadn't been seen for a hundred years um, yes. uh, but because I was particularly got on the expedition with my friends I was helping with the spiders and the cockroaches and insects are really my thing oh funnily enough yeah. I've got loads of insects out at the minute and the most interesting is just there one second yeah so show, please show us as many specimens as you can James I'm so interested uh, so I know you were talking this isn't this isn't a particularly big specimen but at the minute oh, let me see if I can right. hold it a bit better there you go so this is uh, Titanus giganteus, the titan beetle. And this wow. is the world's largest species of beetle. Longest, sorry. Longest species of beetle okay. without enlarged jaws. And this is a slightly... Uh, they can, you know, they can get much bigger. Uh, but this... I've, I've got a few specimens in my collection and I'm currently working on repopulating a whole set of entomology drawers for a friend of mine. Um, and this is um, in the maybe pile because it's quite expensive, but he just happened to be sitting there to show you. 
Um, but yeah, <laughs> wow, and so. <laughs> you you yeah, said about going on one. these um, um you said you said about going on these travels James um that you'd love to go and see you know the gorillas and some of these specimens that you've got and yeah. snorkeling but I know that you've brought something but I bet it, bet you wouldn't go snorkeling with that would you Oh yeah well <laughs> funny enough it attacked me as I was getting it off the wall <laughs> only for you would I do this it was a right. right old pig to get off the wall. He normally <laughs> hangs in a spot over there. But anyway, yeah. I, I do like showing this off because he is quite the envy of um, um, quite a lot of collectors. Oh, and it is heavy. So there you go. So, no, I wouldn't go snorkeling. <laughs> no, I wouldn't go snorkeling with one of these. I would like to see it in the wild, though. Um, so, yeah. of course, this is a leopard seal. Um, an antique wall-mounted head mount. Um, so, yeah, he sits flush on the wall. And there you go. And amazingly, this was um, another auction purchase. So, at a well-known well auction house, but a good few years ago now, like this is maybe eight or ten years ago, um, and it's within that time that taxidermy really has gone up in value. Um, there are a few people with deeper pockets than most of us that are pushing the prices up, in my opinion. Some uh, famous film directors have got into taxidermy. There's uh, various American and European collectors with, um, you know, deep pockets that are pushing the unique and the very good taxidermy up. So I got this just before that happened. And it sort of was overlooked in this auction uh, because, again, I, I, you know, I don't mean to sound like a broken record, but it is the only one that I know of in private hands in the world. Uh, to, uh, they, they must exist. Other mounts must exist. But I then I don't know of any, to my knowledge. I've, I've one friend of mine in the UK has got a skull, which is very desirable, that is an, on, on an old wooden shield mount. Uh, but they're the only two leopard seal specimens that I know of. Uh, as I say, they do exist. Another friend in the Falklands says that they sort of get washed up, but they're immediately snapped up by local museums in the Falklands. Um, but yeah, this is an antique mount. It has had restoration because it was, um, you can probably see along the sides, the, the, the uh, skin had split, but it's a real skull mount. And what is amazing Again, as a zoologist, let me put this against my black shirt. What is amazing are their dentition. So you'll see that their molars are trident shaped. And this is perfect for grabbing a penguin. Uh, but also they can take a mouthful of krill and then use these trident shapes to interlock against one another so that they can close their mouth on a mouthful of krill expel the water and then just gulp down the um uh the, yeah the mouthful of krill without any water there's another seal the crab eater seal which has got sort of similar teeth um and that it, they are adapted for crushing as you might imagine crabs um but yeah truly amazing animal and and specimen yeah so there you go. and and these have been known to like divers don't go in the water with these, do they? I mean, they're known as a sort of dangerous animal, as such, aren't they, James? Oh yeah, they're for, they're, they're you know they're ferocious. However, mm. they're you know in in recent years I've seen some uh, footage of obviously divers and things that, were, that are much braver than <laughs> I, or maybe <laughs> not as clever as most people. And there, there's this amazing footage of this. Um, uh, you know, wildlife uh, photographer, filmer. And the leopard seal, it just keeps, you know, investigating the scuba diver, getting really up close to the lens, then sort of realising that it's not a threat and maybe, you know, a man in a rubber suit is not going to be very tasty. So mm. it starts bringing over this carcass of a penguin as a sort of gift to this new new 
thing that the, the the seal is encountering and it's really amazing and uh, yeah find it on youtube the, the guy discusses it and the footage is incredible but that's um incredible. yeah like i would think that's probably a pretty unique set of circumstances in most in most cases it's going to have you and it's going to really have you i mean that it's ridiculous the um size and the teeth on this it's absolutely amazing absolutely incredible yeah. isn't it, it really so yeah is. once and what a bit of even once reason. a year uh, a collector messages me and goes do you want to sell the leopard seal yet and keeps up and up in his price another another collector <laughs> does the same thing and again uh, as a as a collector uh, sort of that's another one of those things that even if you got a ridiculous price for mm. i can't go out and replace it and so yeah, I'm a collector at heart. I, you know, I haven't got any money in the bank or whatever. All my money is here. I enjoy it. So if I yeah. got X amount for that, I'd only go out and try and replace it. And it, nothing would be as good as that, you see? So, yeah. yeah. Well, that's it. Uh, people don't realise that collectors is sort of like their stock is a bit like their savings as well. Like, you know, sometimes if you're desperate, you might have to delve into it you know, or if there's something that you really want, you might have to sell something else to fund that, you know. Yeah, people don't sort yeah. of realise how passionate all our sort of collectors and dealers are. We're basically dealers to fund a collection. Yeah, <laughs> well, exactly that. And uh, <laughs> obviously, I'm trying to show you some of my best stuff. And so all these things are... I'd really rather go hungry or lose the house, uh, lose the roof over my head. I'd, I'd be if I ever, if anything ever got really bad, I would just be coiled, <laughs> curled up somewhere with Grant under one arm and the leopard seal under another. You know, with a pot, just asking for spare yeah. change. Be, I, I, and that inside really the... is how how much these things mean to me. Um, you know, <laughs> up, oh, not to penguin. You know, and some things haven't got masses of value but you just mr pickles he's he's a he's a firm favorite with followers and went a bit viral on tiktok and all that sort of thing i've had him years but it's just the way he's been mounted and he ordinarily lives at home but we're in between properties at the moment um he normally sits on his own little throne in our living room but he's here for safekeeping for the moment um but again and that's another, another thing actually I'm, James. I'm strict it? instructions not for sale <laughs> uh dogs have really gone up in value as well haven't they like um there was a big um someone yes. collecting them from america yeah, wasn't they just enormously recently? so so they were always they were always um pretty niche you know there were mm. always people that enjoyed domestic animal taxidermy but you know having had my shop for over 10 years that is the thing that really divides people. So right. occasionally I have some in stock and people, you know, really offended by them or I or think they're amazing. Mm. But because the prices that they demand now, they're, they're quite expensive. Um, mm. uh, but yeah, they seem to be more desirable. As soon as people twig that something is desirable, everybody's looking for it. And, 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 and then there is a premium but uh, yeah, there's a handful of specific collectors that have have pushed that price up, in in my opinion, and and just buy everything. You know, I can't get close to buying things at auction now, um, particularly the antique taxidermy. I've got uh, uh, antique dogs and cats. Um, I've got a few in in my collection, and again, they are. I wouldn't want to sell them because I like to have a sort of comprehensive collection i'd like to have an example of this of a victorian taxidermy against a modern mount or whatever but like we were saying if mm. they could go if the price was right because to fund something that is more of interest to me uh one of my favorite yeah. dog dog pieces is i've got a full mount terrier in a case and it's more or less nose to nose with a badger coming out of a set Wow. And that's that's a that's a really rare case. But again, that we, I I can't show you because it's over there and in a massive case. But um, <laughs> it's on it's on my Instagram. Yeah, yeah. That, actually, we'll discuss that. So your Instagram, if people want to go and find you, 
Um, where did I go? Basically, yeah. where are you on? You know, so, you know. Um, yeah, yeah. So uh, I'm at the taxidermist, all one word, on both Instagram and TikTok. Um, I've, you know, the my Instagram was really how I opened the shop. I've had Instagram for about 12 years, hence why I managed to get a good name because it was in the early days one friend a friend at the pub one time went oh have you heard of this new thing for sharing photos of stuff and I was like oh I like photos you know I, I love photos <laughs> oh what the hell? taxidermy had gone or whatever it was and so I, oh the taxidermist bang right and then all of a sudden people were then going oh is this for sale is this for sale and I was like oh okay there's a market here and back then there was not very many people doing taxidermy or natural history on Instagram so stuff was and when the algorithm was better, the cursed algorithm, oh, when it was terrible. all natural and chronological and all this sort of thing, it would, you know, a duckling would get like a thousand likes back when I only had 1500 followers or whatnot. Anyway, that's a different conversation, maybe over a drink where we can moan about social media. But um, uh, yes, I'm at the, at the taxidermist. I post my collection on there. I uh, sort of work it now that if I've got something for sale, it predominantly goes up on my stories and you can just send me a DM. I'm one of those anomalies where I've never got a website up and running. There is one sat dormant somewhere, but nothing ever goes on it um, because stuff and stuff comes and goes so off so quickly that it doesn't really warrant it. I'm a one man band. Uh, my father helps me at tattoo conventions that I trade up and down the country. Uh, Francesca has uh, been more involved over the years. Um, but yeah, there's always stuff for sale. If you're looking for something in particular, just send me a DM on on Instagram um, or my number's there. Send me a WhatsApp. That is my number. You can call me, WhatsApp me if you've got something for sale or looking for something in particular. I live and breathe this. I don't switch off from the moment. I dream about it. I wake up. I'm chasing that next thing in my emails or messages or try or selling something in my emails or messages. I come to the shop, I restore stuff, clean stuff, you know, do new displays. Then when I'm at home and people are normally doom scrolling, I'm researching something obscure. So I've recently been re-looking at baculums. I'm, I'm fascinated by baculums. Let me see if... <laughs> Oh right, go on then. Yeah, we'll have, we'll have a back you know, can, yeah. Have you got your walrus one? Okay, right, one second. Is that what you've got? <laughs> <laughs> it's a cla it's a classic. I sort of take a back. I take this Is particular baculum most places. I was on uh, oh something <laughs> oh something else. Foot Asylum, guess the profession, and this this came on, and it's been it's been all over and handled by many people it's taking on a really nice patina <laughs> because it's been handled so much but yeah, so them any noises. true Wunderkammer uh, enthusiast or natural history um uh, collector will know what a baculum is but for those that don't that are new to it a baculum is a penis bone humans <laughs> are one of the only species that don't have a bone in their pen uh, in their penis to aid in intercourse it's literally hence the name boner to help you, you know, help the animal uh, penetrate and intercourse. And it's also believed that some of the hooked, <laughs> we didn't know that it's going to get so dirty so quickly. Um, it's also thought that some, some of the hooked penises are thought to sort of uh, go in and then scrape out the previous Oh, okay, right. I didn't realise that. Stuff. Yeah, get out. Yes, get my yeah, yeah. Uh, you know. <laughs> Right. Yeah, basically, you know, survival of the fi fittest. If you've got yeah. a longer baculum and the female yeah. has been mated previously, you're going to want to get the other stuff out before you put yours yeah. in, right? <laughs> so that's yeah. what it's thought. <laughs> this one is a, um, a a walrus, poor Mrs. Walrus, or lucky Mrs. Walrus, whichever <laughs> way you want to look at it. Um, but, um, you know, I've got t tiny ones that are from a, like a bonnet macaque and uh, the classic one is a raccoon. They are thought to uh, have been used by the old um, Westerners and whiskey makers and moonshiners as toothpicks and as a way yeah. of a 
putting a, a penis bone into a, a moonshine barrel down into another barrel and giving it a different sort of taste and all that sort of thing. But I've just got, and it's it's still in the car because I'm literally only just back from a week long buying trip. Um, uh, a fossil um, bearded seal penis bone that's going into my collection and it's really weird um and not not only i'm <laughs> sort of not not just uh bones i there's an interest in um genitalia because it, it, it sort of looks interesting one of my wish list pieces is a whale dork they're known as a dork but they're you know can be six foot long and it's a, the taxidermy skin of a whale penis which was often used as a um a, a standing lamp you'd light it and it would illuminate a room i've only ever wow. seen one example of those um but again that's actually that's money. a good thing james we could talk about this actually so your dream pieces have you got like a top three oh, dream sure. pieces that you you know want to get into your um, collection basically well i suppose you know what it's like you you you're aware of things that you want to acquire so a narwhal is a classic a giant clam is a classic i've got those there are yep. Yep. things that you discover that you realize that you can't live without that you didn't know existed and then you have to have them and so they've come along i mean one of those is a well i knew that they obviously existed but a dugon skull um so you know it's the relative of the manatee and the stellar sea cow but i've got a dugon skull again one of only a handful in private hands. That's all got the Article 10 licenses and whatnot. Um, but I suppose, uh, you know, one of my wish list pieces came back up for sale recently, and that was what we were touching on earlier. And I, I, I actually once owned it, and I was trying to right a wrong in my past, and it was a Javan rhinoceros head that I um, once owned and 10 years ago sold it because you know it was too valuable to keep and it came back up for sale for less than I sold it for and we tried to get it back but it just went too much and I'm a yeah. firm believer of everything happens for a reason it's not the right time in our lives to to get that back uh, I'm sure it will turn back up and I'll get it again one day I do have other rhino heads in my collection they're not kept here because again of the value um they they don't have the horns on them um they've 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 been separated long ago not by me but um i'm interested in rhinos because i did my dissertation on rhinoceros horn whilst when i that's what my zoology degree was capped off with my dissertation was on rhinoceros horn um but other wish list specimens a full mount gorilla legal mm. antique big silverback um i i don't know of any but, uh, but maybe one will turn up one day um <laughs> i'm not sure if, there's always something there's always something that's my trouble oh i did get a really really you know when um obviously you have to pay up for stuff when people know what they've got but i had a phenomenal uh deal the other day that i was just so pleased with at auction again and it, it was a wish list piece um a full mount taxidermy baby hippo um wow. and so um yeah it was listed as a model in this auction catalog before oh, yeah. some other taxidermy being sold off by a museum and i was like i've had i've had one in the past on sale or return again when i opened the shop i had some i was working with some other collectors and had pieces on sale or return so I knew what a baby hippo looked like, taxidermy. And I was like, I didn't have a chance to go and view it because it was all the way up north. And I was like, I'm going to take a punt on this. Even if it's a model, where do you get a life-size baby hippo antique model from? That's going to be good as it is. Anyway, went to collect it. And sure enough, it's a taxidermy mount. So I was well pleased with that. Just needs a bit of nice. restoration. It's probably... Hmm, you're going to edit this anyway. I could probably get it and just sh show you its head. One second. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> well, he's, he's very well done, so actually. He's, he's <laughs> a nice look, hasn't he? 
Oh, it's lovely. So again, it's a period. It's a period one from the 1930s, and for all intents and purposes, it looks like a model because all the all the big animals, elephant, um, hippo, rhinos, they lose their colour. The the skin loses its colour mostly, particularly in an individual. So they have to be painted. So this thing does look like. So it's, it's it's quite heavy, so I've lost my breath. Um, <laughs> so it does just look like a model, right? Um, and the yeah. ear and the towel has been restored. And so where that has broken again, it just looks like plaster. So the auctioneer and indeed the museum just thought it was a model. But when you were going to collect it, you can see that the toes are real. And then up along its belly, there is incision mark from where it was skinned. So it is a real right. taxidermy baby Brilliant. hippo. And that's what happens, James, isn't it? If you are if you are sleeping, dreaming, living, breathing taxidermy, you are finding this sort of stuff. You know, you've got to put this effort into it well, as well. Because it's, yeah, I suppose so. It, you know, you, um, you make your own luck. Yeah, so that, as I, such, I, I, haven't had a win, I haven't had a win like that for a long time because most auction houses and at antique fairs, dealers know what they're doing. You know, everybody's got Google now. Mm, everybody's yeah. got Google image search. You see a weird brass thing yeah. or stuffed bird or whatever, you can Google image it and it will tell you what it is, what it's worth, mostly. Yeah. Um, so that was a nice... Little win. I only you're know almost on to a winner. You're hours. almost on to a winner now. A winner now, James. When you Google lend something and it doesn't come up, basically, you know you're on to something. Well, exactly that. <laughs> exactly that. Yeah. If there, if you, <laughs> you know, yeah, if you, if you Google image something and it doesn't come up with anything, buy it because you probably have found <laughs> yeah. something weird or different. Well, I tell you what, James, that is a great tip to leave us with i think because i think we've been on 47 minutes and you know we'd love to have you back on again as well and we can obviously go into more the curio side because i know you'd also do curios oh, I, I would love to i mean if, you know have you seen my recent um curiosity some of the queen's oh. hair wow i mean what where <laughs> is it from the queen's hairdresser <laughs> but that's not natural the... history we'll we'll get into that another time yeah exactly uh, and yeah, i did legitimately some of the queen's hair yeah, and I did and, see um, uh, the other you know, week letters written by Darwin and all this sort of thing. Oh, that's great! And I did see the other week you were um, you were bidding on a human brain. <laughs> oh, you saw? Yes. So I'm sure. Oh, you've had Henry on the, yes. the wonderful, lovely Henry, Mister Scrag. Yeah. Um, curiosities <laughs> from the fifth corner. Yeah. Um. Yeah, love Henry. I actually. Um, but did one of his first biggest deals when he became a dealer. Not, you know, not wishing to take credit. He's become amazing in his own right. But I, I've had the shop November 2013 is when I got it. And within the first few months, I remember him pulling up in the lay-by outside and walking to the door with a hyena skeleton. <laughs> and I bought that and some other human skulls off of him. Um, but yes, he has become a specialist in human remains. I mean, bow to Henry for the human remains. I can't even get close to uh, where he gets it from or, yeah. or or the quantity that he gets. It's absolutely amazing. He's the king of human stuff. <laughs> I'm the prince of taxidermy. There are other people, obviously. Um, but um, yes, I've always wanted a human brain, a complete yeah. good example. I'm not massively interested in human stuff uh, i have acquired stuff over the years some as i've been lucky enough for some stuff to be given to me and if anything is ever donated or given to me i will never sell it that's okay. that's not how i work so i've got some um yeah some specimens like that but i've always wanted a brain because i think they're a a beautiful object just amazing that you know that was the seat of somebody's thoughts and feelings and knowledge and you know it's absolutely amazing that that is what made somebody work once um but i'm also a big fan of comedy and uh young frankenstein is one of my favorite films 
And so, yes, I'd like a brain in a jar to then have one like with a label that says Abbey Normal. <laughs> so, yeah. James, I think we'll wrap this up, mate. Um, thank you so much for yeah, coming on and showing us all of these amazing specimens. I mean, they're absolutely incredible and um, people are just going to enjoy seeing this. And um, please um, come on again, you know, and we'll talk all about your curios because that's just another, you know, field that we just really need to see as well. Yeah, absolutely. So, well, I, I, I love what you post and what you do. Your podcast series is, is looking fantastic. You're getting great guests on. Every one of them has been entertaining and interesting and you learn something. Um, we've only touched the tip of the iceberg in my collection, so I'd love to be on. If you've got something, ever a specific topic, I've most likely got something to talk about. And, uh, yeah, we'll get to curios another time. But I'm looking forward to this coming out and seeing who else you have on. Really enjoyed yeah, it. Yeah, um, I'll touch on that. Um, you know, in the future, we're going to have some big guests coming on. Uh, you know, James is obviously a massive guest and I've got some brilliant ones lined up. So please go to the YouTube channel, like, subscribe, you know, tell your friends. Um, you know, like I said, we're going to have guests on from all around the world. And it's just like an incredibly cool show and tell. You know, we're going to, you're going to be seeing some incredible pieces, you know, like shrunken heads, mummies, mermaids, you know, you name it, you're going to be seeing it. Illuminated manuscripts, just to touch on a few things that we've got coming Ooh. in the future. So, you know, it's great. And obviously, anybody out there, if you want to have a go as well and come on and you think you've got something that is worthy of the Wonder Camera podcast, come on and show it. Get in touch. DM me. Um, that would be great. So, everybody, that was James Cranfield. And, um, you know, go and see him. Go and watch his on Instagram. Go and have a look. You know, He's the man when it comes to taxidermy. Cheers, James. Cheers. Thank you. Cheers, Ed. See you.